thumbs up from the safety crew, I believe. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Mr. Dizzy. And now for Dinner with Racers with your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Placeholder Radio Sound. I'm a driver. I'm very angry. The sound of a driver on the radio during a race. Alaskans, the summer solstice provides a benchmark for peak summer activity. And when it falls on a weekend, it means it's time to go racing. Are you David Elliott? Yes, sir. The David Elliott? The David Elliott. Are you Stu? Yeah, I'm Stu. Hey, Ryan Eversley, how are you? Good, where are you up? I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I just talked to someone claiming to be your brother. That's my little brother, yeah. And he said he was a way better driver than you. Is that not? No? Never driven a race it? car. Yeah. So you're racing the late model class? Yeah, yeah. and then we, we have won my, the championship my nine year old is okay. the youngest competitor by far out here in the oh, Bandolero. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a whole family effort then. The whole yeah, family. exactly. Yeah. What's special about racing in Alaska? Oh, this, if you turn around and you see the Pioneer Peak and like everything around us is just, it's crazy when you come out of turn two and this is what you're staring at. So this is the hobby then? This is a. Uh, well, it's actually set up as a business. Oh, OK. It's a so business. We found, we found some pros. But uh, yeah. hopefully I break even this year. I was going to say, you were looking for a way to lose some money. Yeah. So exactly. you started a business in racing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do for a living? Uh, I drive heavy haul semi trucks for STR Alaska. OK. My nickname there is actually NASCAR because I race. So <laughs> we all got nicknames. It's, it's, it's crazy. You drive semi truck by week. And then you get to race by weekend, and it's it's kind of cool. Like it's a TV show upon itself, but it's it's pretty cool. Are you pitching us right now? I'll pitch you. <laughs> oh hey, there he is. Hey Ryan, how are you? Hey Dan, it's good to see you. Nice to see you, sir. Doing all right. Welcome to Alaska. Thank you. When we were picking our sort of uh, variety of people to speak to about the Alaskan motorsport scene. One of the questions we had was like, who is the, sort of say it? Yeah, man, say it. No. Say it. Yeah, <laughs> who is, who is I don't the, think so. He hates who it. is the Roger Penske of Alaskan motorsport? And Dana Pruz is the name that kept coming up. You kept kind of coming tried, up. I, do you I, hate it or do you like that phrase? I don't like it. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. I, don't, there, I can't hold a candle to that gentleman. Here on the professional side of your life, you have a ton of equipment for the construction business, something like 300 pieces. Yeah, plus or minus, you know, that includes all the trailers and pickups and asphalt plants and crushing gear and 299 too many. <laughs> <laughs> What's the main job that you guys do? In Alaska, there's not a lot of one thing, so you do a little bit of everything. So we do airports, highways, roads, bridges, subdivisions, large site development. Yeah. We have our own portable asphalt plants. We move on site. We went into your uh, business today. Yep. One, your car is very well prepared, but you're also using that in leverage with your business. In the yeah. sense of like what, what Roger Penske does extremely well is that all of his businesses leverage against one another to help everything grow. And by virtue of having a huge construction company, you're in a very similar position where tooling can be shared. Your sponsor is a sand company or gravel company. Gravel and sand, yeah. That's um, one of my companies. That's one of your companies, see? So we have a fun side of the shop yeah. and a work side. And this is the fun side. Right. Our uh, race team actually works here at the company. They're, they're maintenance and mechanics on our heavy equipment, so it works out pretty good. They spend their evenings sometimes here working on the cars. Early mornings, they come in early. Of course, obviously weekends. Mm -hmm. If there's a uh, tractor that needs to be fixed or the race car that needs to be fixed, is there any sort of priority? Absolutely, the tractor. OK, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the track. The sponsorship. The, yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. Arguably, no one in Alaskan racing is a professional, so to speak. No one is making no. their living by going out and racing. There's not even an arrive and drive team. Like even in Jamaica, there were people that made a living off of a arrive and drive program. Yeah. That does not exist in Alaska. We're amateurs. Right. This is an amateur sport up here. So in terms of the Alaskan stock car racing scene, what is the class structure? Is late model the highest form? Yeah, it's the premium class. The cars typically come up from the lower 48. So basically nobody's building their own top late model chassis here in Alaska. No. No, you're, if, if anything, you buy the chassis or you buy a front clip or rear clip. Mm -hmm. Typically, they're four to 10 years old by the time we get them in Alaska. I got gotcha. you. You got to look at Alaska like an island. 
Yeah. You know, we're 1,500 air miles from Seattle. Attracting a variety of budgets, ages, as well as personalities, a day of racing is filled with categories for racers of all types. But when it comes to Alaskan resourcefulness, the bomber class sets a whole new standard. Are you Ryan? That would be me. That's so weird. I feel like we met 10 minutes ago. That's something like that. It's weird, you have a mic pack on and everything. I, I don't know where it came from. Yeah. I initially pitched the idea of this class to Michelle Lackey and her father Earl Lackey yeah. that we needed another class because at the time we only had four running over there and yeah. and also the entry level class was legend cars. Yes. And a seven thousand dollar car is not necessarily entry level for right. most people. Right. What are they calling bombers for? Well, where I grew up in Indianapolis, we had a class called Thunder Cars yeah. that run full size. Crown Vicks, Caprices, stuff like that. Big old boats. Okay. Nobody wants them. Right. Like Derby car. Well, we had the same thing here. They're very affordable to get in Alaska. Okay. Uh, we started calling them bombers because I was in the Air Force. I always worked on fighters, but to me, these things are bigger. Yeah. Call them bombers. I don't know why. That was my reasoning at the time. More so than many states, it seems like Alaska, you either grew up here or you came here for some specific reason, more so than just choosing to move here. And so you fit the second category. Yes, I um, fall under the same category as a lot of the people that are transplants. Yeah. Military moved me here. Yeah. I would say probably one out of every four people you meet, that's the same story that they're right. gonna have. Right. Just, that's the nature of the state. Right. Bases all over the place. Growing up in Indianapolis and ending up here, it's the scenery. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so beautiful, and the peace and quiet, I guess, is something that I wasn't used to. But growing up as a, as a racing guy in Indianapolis, was looking for a local racetrack one of the first things you did when you tried to check I, out the Alaska I was, it's this, the day I got orders up here, Yeah. I was already looking to see if there was racetracks mm -hmm. up here. <laughs> it's not to the scale yeah. by any means as Indianapolis, but to say that there's no racers here that are dedicated would be a very false statement right. because across all the different categories of racing, there's people that hear that actually do that. And yeah. I'm just a part of it that I never realized it either till I moved up here, but man, it's, <laughs> it's a thing. It is. There weren't enough cars in, weren't enough classes, I guess, at Alaska Raceway Park. Yeah. I wanted more cars, more competition, what this has provided is a fun outlet. It's just a car you can park outside. It can sit in the snow. Right. You don't yeah. care about it. You leave it for six months and come back when the snow melts and it's started up. It's like going to the go-kart track on the weekend. So just to spell this out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make this bomber class work and make a good show for the fans, you single-handedly on an Air Force mechanic's salary built six to eight of these cars that you're just letting other people run to make sure this class survives. At the time, I had sold about half of them. Yeah. I ran a two-car rental program all of last year. And when you say sold, I'm thinking it's not a profiteering kind Absolutely of thing. I'm not. thinking you made yeah. some materials money back. I paid back materials it, money. And broke. definitely not your time. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hearing uh, if we had lunch with Dana Pruz, who's the Roger Penske of Alaskan Racing, I'm, I think we're sitting across from uh, young Ray Everham building the IROC yeah. series and now the Superstar Racing Experience. Yeah. I, I guess that's a somewhat decent comparison there. Yeah, you'll, you'll accept those terms? You'll accept yeah. being called the Ray yeah. Everham of anything? Yeah, I think that's okay. <laughs> All right, we're about 20 miles into the last run of the Iditarod. 40 miles left to go, and it's not gonna be an easy last trek. Um, as you can see, we got a little fresh snow, but the dogs are doing fantastically well. And this is why it's so important to have a healthy, vital dog team right up to the end, because you know, these last miles can be very challenging. Of course, when it comes to racing in Alaska, 
having horsepower isn't the only option. Come on, guys. That's cheesy. Hey, I'm Ryan. We're not really just doing the fake intro, are we? That's exactly what we're doing. Okay, sounds yeah, good. Yeah, so yeah, nice to yeah. meet you, Oh, man. you too. Oh, wow, right. how'd we get out of here? From Atlanta, uh, Georgia. Yeah. So our podcast obviously is normally focused on motorsports folks. You are a racer by every definition. Different kind of power. Elevator pitch on what exactly the event is. The Iditarod is, first of all, the world championships of long distance racing. It is the biggest event in sled dog mushing. It's a thousand miles across Alaska. Everything that mother nature has to throw at you, whether it's storms, you know, lack of snow, too much snow, the terrain, rivers, mountains, the Bering Sea coast. You see the leaders keep swinging back and forth up there. They're trying to find the best track and sometimes they're a little too indecisive. There's about 20 checkpoints that you can resupply your sled from. Um, you can stay there if you want, you don't have to. It's up to you how you manage your team over that trail, over that thousand miles, how long you rest, how fast you travel. Well, when we left the last checkpoint 20 miles ago, we had an hour lead, and uh, I think that lead's probably only growing as these guys just power through this stuff. We do not stop down at night. This is a round-the-clock game, so as soon as they say go, it's on. This particular property, I've been here about three years, so we still got a lot of stuff under development, right. finishing the puppy pens and setting up this whole kennel, which is kind of a unique style of kennel. Sure. Is that carbon? That is. This one is a, a very unique design of sled. Obviously, it's gone to seed. We're just using it for tour stuff now, but but it, it, this one's designed to carry dogs, so it's kind of like a, a boat. Okay. It's, this is the school bus. I see. Way bigger than what I normally race with, yeah. but early in the race, when I have too much power, I can preserve some power by letting dogs ride in the sled. So the entire side is rigid. The, okay. the strength comes from the entire shell. There's not any one support. There's no critical part to it. Right. It's still reasonably flexible, yeah, yeah, definitely. but it's, it's huge. In racing, we have enormous, enormous rule books. As far as I understand, the, the main rule you're dealing with is the number of dogs. Are there rules about the sleds? Are there rules about the size of the dogs, anything like that? The rules are actually very vague and intentionally vague for huh. the most part. This is kind of a rough and tumble sport, right? This right. is the guys who figure out how to solve problems and get from point A to point B. And however you want to go about doing it, who's to tell me that I'm wrong? Other than the hard fact of, well, that didn't work. <laughs> right, 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 right. In this sled, we're usually carrying all the stuff that we use every single day. Mm -hmm. The stuff that we use for cooking for the dogs, you know, kind of your emergency repair kits. If anything breaks on the sled, yeah or in your tow line or your equipment, nobody can help us. We don't have a pit crew. Sure. So when we stop to care for the dogs, as soon as the dogs are fed and on their straw beds and sleeping, I'm then doing sled repairs. And that's why as a person, you get next to no sleep on the Iditarod. Oh, the Sean dogs, would be great at it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dogs will get eight to 10 and a half hours of sleep a day. Okay. As a human, I'm getting maybe two 45 minute naps a day because when they stop, that's when I go to work. Yeah, right, right. I'm the only one on the team with opposable thumbs. So all the massages, <laughs> all the cooking, I, I get stuck with all that. They want people to try things. They want innovation. Mushing is a very old mode of transportation, mm -hmm. but it's a very young sport. This is a 53-foot refrigerated reefer trailer, right? Okay. Right here, we've got a 50-foot treadmill and I can hook up an entire 16 dogs, and these guys can all run and pull just like in the wintertime, and when it's 70, 80 degrees outside, too hot for them to do a meaningful workout, okay. I can have it 35 to 40 degrees in here, and now we can do a six, seven hour workout. And that's, so it's summertime training. And here, I can sit there and watch side view of a dog for an hour. Yeah. I can get in front of them and watch how their legs break. I can take my phone and yeah. record a slow motion video, right, and now right. watch it in the most slow, mm -hmm. with no, undulations or any terrain differences. Are you the only one that has one of these? On this scale, yes. In racing, it's not uncommon for like a lower tier team or a less funded team to complain about the big factory efforts that are mm -hmm. hurting racing. Are you the dad that has the giant dog treadmill that no one else has? So like, of course he's doing well, he's got the treadmill. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, Profit. You awake, buddy? So this Hi. is our, our spiritual Hi. leaders. He's one of the, the greatest of all time. Yeah? Um, so we're yeah. meeting a legend right now? This year, he was, <laughs> of all the dogs, I mean, he was the super stud in the team, Yeah. For sure. Oh my goodness, there's a camera. And he's like. Larry, I'm not with him, man. Yeah, you... yeah we, don't know, we don't know this dude. Yeah. So Mater, he's more of a trainer at this point. Okay. Really good dog, but not quite at Dude. that same level. 
So, but he's an amazing lead dog. So he ends up training a lot of the young dogs, okay. training puppies. Yeah. Um, and those guys are very valuable in the kennel too. Because sure. a lot of what we're doing is not just training a racing team. We're running sure. a developmental program. Sure, you got to be keeping your your necks keep, up and comers, exactly. right? Yeah. <laughs> so Oates is just too big to okay. race, right? Um, oh yes, you're very sweet though. Look at those paws. So yeah, he, yeah, this is too big for a sled dog. Okay. I've had dogs about this size um, make it, but they are they're freaks of nature. Okay. Right. Now Barley, he's a little <laughs> bit lighter frame, just a touch shorter, and this guy won several Iditarods with me. Oh wow. And part of it is if the dog knows how to utilize their body. Yeah. So he had a very efficient floating trot. Um, and so he, he can make it work, and that's one of the things I'm doing when I'm training them as two and three year olds is identifying, all right, he's a big boy, but he's got a gait that can do it. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, we should get you guys out mushing here, huh? Yeah. You want to go mushing, Barley? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to go mushing? You said the magic word. It's legitimately intimidating. <laughs> is it? Yeah, I mean, because, like, I have a break, but they're animals. As you can see, these guys aren't huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was my first thing I was surprised to see when we walked up. Oh, these guys, they are Alaskan Huskies, which is a mixed breed dog. Yeah. Um, the Alaskan Husky kind of came from the gold rush era in Alaska, uh -huh. in the early, early 1900s, some major gold strikes. Dogs were the main mode of transportation. Yeah. So people brought any dog they had to Alaska, crossed it with the Malamutes and Siberians, kind of the native pulling dogs. Right, right. The resulting mutt was just generically called the Alaskan Husky. I see. And so that's where these guys kind of started. That was also where the first long distance races started. As far as the dogs, it just says they have to be an Arctic breed dog capable of, you know, being comfortable in these conditions. Yeah. So what they don't want is to somebody to show up with standard poodles, sure, which sure. did happen once, and that's why the rule came up. <laughs> so it, if we tried to enter with all corgis, we're gonna get turned yep, away? Yep, okay. yeah, oh, you, we'll... you have to be sent back to England, so. Oh, come on. <laughs>
Alaskan racer, utilizing one's resources defines the culture. But when it comes to maximizing those resources, one family of drag racers sets a new standard. I'm guessing you're Jay. I am Jay. Because you're wearing the mic pack I gave you five minutes ago, <laughs> but we're just meeting. That would yeah, be so. Yeah. That would be so. What's your earliest memory of your dad's drag racing career? They used to push start the cars, you know, down the track. Yeah. And then this is real vivid to me is uh, I'd never heard a nitro car before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that thing was just so loud. And I remember standing on the line going, that thing's blowing up, it's blowing right, up. Right. Cause I heard nitrous boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, whoa, what is this thing coming at me? Yeah. So well, here's the shop all out here. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is yeah. not what we expected at all. Oh, well, you know. This is legit. <laughs> this is how we play in Alaska, right? This could be like Indianapolis. Yeah, there you go. How did, how did this happen? This is Jay's idea. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the racing we've seen so far on this trip has been people doing it for the love of the sport in their after hours with their extra time. You seem to be able to do this full time and at a very high level, the cars that you have in your shop are not just like club racing levels of cars, they're world class builds. Over here, we got a twin turbocharged car we're building for a real special customer of ours. Yeah. When it's done, it should be the baddest car in the state. Really? Of Alaska, yeah. How fast is this thing going to go? This thing should run low sixes at probably 230 mile an hour yeah. and a quarter mile. Yeah, it's just faster so, than I've ever gone before, so yeah. yeah. Usually people that want to get something done end up here. I've been doing it since the late 70s. I mean, my heart has always been into this, so. Always wanted to do it and love doing it, so it's just kind of a natural progression. Over in here, we actually pressure test our cylinder heads. Yeah. We have a Rottler hone, a Rottler boring bar, mm -hmm. you know, mill there, a lathe, another lathe. That's a massive lathe. Uh, yeah, that's our baby lathe. We got another one out there that's bigger than that. We've noticed that almost everybody we've met in Alaska, nobody does one thing. Mm -hmm. And even if you have one business, that business yep. doesn't do one thing. Yeah. We actually build transmissions. We have a complete machine shop. Um, we have a welding fabrication shop. We've done some oil filled work, you know. I mean, our shop, we're busy all the time, but racing season is pretty short up here. Yeah. So you have to uh, be diverse in this economy. And that's what we've done. So. Is this a result of the fact that you guys live basically on an island here in Alaska compared to being able to get parts and stuff as easily back in the low 48? You know, we we're getting stuff machined in New York. Oh, wow. And I was like, this is crazy yeah. having stuff out in New York. So then I, we just started accumulating our own tools so we could do it ourselves. Yeah. One of the things I'm going to take away from my time in Alaska from the motorsport side of things is that it's definitely a bigger family sport than I've ever seen in anywhere else. And I've gone all over North America for racing. Why is that? Why is Alaska so based on family and community? Well, you know, Alaska is a remote state, right? So when you're trying to get race car parts, you actually, you know, try to use everybody you can, you know, that's close to you. So that's probably why we work so good together. And I mean, that's all Alaskans typically try to help out Alaskans first. I'm thoroughly impressed. We, Sean and I didn't expect this. Yeah. You know, we didn't know we were going to be walking into like such a high end shop. All right, where are we going? Uh, we are going to the Wildlife Alaska Conservation Center. Why? Because I want to pet a baby muskox. What does that have to do with racing? Absolutely nothing. Ah. So I've noticed that no one else is getting a gator ride. Well, we call this the VIP for a reason. Nice, nice. <laughs> we're media, we're a big deal. <laughs> totally. So where am I right now? Right now, we are in the Alaska Wildlife Conservation mm -hmm. Center. This place exists as a sanctuary. We're dedicated to preserving Alaska's wildlife through conservation, mm -hmm. education, research, and quality animal care. The brown bears are all front and center, too. Oh, so which, yeah, look at the size which of that one would shot. you guys like? Oh, the big one. Yeah, okay. the one that's the size of the car. 
So why does a bear in Alaska need to be kept in a conservation center? Well, bears are very intelligent animals, and once they've learned that food can come from people, they know that and they will continue to seek food from people. That is ridiculously big. They are quite a bit bigger. Joe Boxer, our biggest bear oh. here, weighs close to a, a thousand pounds probably when he's at his heaviest. We have three in this habitat, JB and Patron, who are brother and sister, and Hugo. The other one is actually right behind oh, that yep. rock. All of them are here because they're orphaned. They were orphaned separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is there a... <laughs> That's, That's insane. <laughs> So thanks for providing bears. These are the first ones we've seen, and they yeah. are, they're to scale. <laughs> so what is an animal sanctuary? An animal sanctuary is a place that cares for animals that can't be released back into the wild, um, or perhaps does rehabilitation for animals that can be released back into the wild, particularly caring for animals that are from the area that the sanctuary is located. What am I looking at here? These are the henslers. Ah. We're lucky enough here to be on the roadkill list. I was gonna say, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if a moose gets hit by a car out there, oftentimes it's donated here. So they get a pretty uh, good replica of things they would eat in the wild. Yeah. But they'll eat everything from moose and caribou to chicken, eggs, occasionally Cereal, some salmon. Usual, yeah, <laughs> I gotcha. So here today, we hung out with bears and we saw wolves. Where are all these animals coming from? All of these species are Alaskan species, and so they're well adapted to the area. We specialize in caring for animals that have been injured or orphaned and oftentimes come here needing to be bottle raised. The baby is nursing. Oh, God. Oh. So bison, I didn't realize that was a thing in Alaska. They were formally listed as extinct. We thought oh. they were gone from the entire planet. Interesting. So in recent history, people didn't have these animals in Alaska. Right. Luckily, a pilot flying over rural Alberta, Canada, found a herd in the middle of nowhere. Huh. And Canada did a very successful reintroduction program. And then in 2008, we decided to follow in step and a herd came here to live with us. Huh. They've been going through a very intentional breeding program yeah. since then. And in 2015, wood bison were released back into the wild in Alaska. That's awesome. Uh, in racing, movies can be really hit or miss. Is there a animal sanctuary or zoo movie or anything like that that comes to mind that's good or bad? Yes. Well, can I, I mean, can, we actually have our own show. Okay. Go on, yep. get it out, get it out. <laughs> Pitch. The Alaska Animal Rescue shows what our staff does year round to care for animals and uh -huh. it represents pretty well. So where are we going now? Right now, we are heading to an off-exhibit area okay. where we have two baby muskox in our care. And in the case of these two muskox, they were both orphaned. Look at that! They're the babies. Oh my god. So this one walking up towards us uh -huh. first is Opal, and right behind her is Jasper. Every year we have naming themes. Right. So this year we picked gemstones. Right. Welcome, guys. <laughs> this is so crazy. So these animals are being bottle raised by staff here. Mm -hmm. So we definitely work to get them used to being comfortable around people since people are gonna be what care for them for their whole life. And down the line when we have to do any medical procedures mm -hmm. or checkups on them, it's gonna help for them to be comfortable with the people working with us. When they first come into our care, they're started on a bottle every four hours. Okay, wow. Okay. And each of those are only a couple of ounces, and as they grow, that quantity increases. Yes. But we decrease the number of feedings per day. Do you guys argue over who gets to bottle feed the baby muskox? It's like, no, it's my turn. <laughs> when they first come in, it's definitely uh, the most exciting thing that has ever happened <laughs> every time it happens. Every time. But with that 24-hour yeah. around-the-clock feeding, we end up uh, being pretty okay with other people volunteering to, okay, yeah. to take those ships. <laughs> if I had to attach a driver to the spirit animal of the muskox, what are some of the characteristics of the muskox? Some of the most notable things that are unique about muskox are that they are the softest animal oh, on okay. earth. They grow the softest down fur sure. known. Soft and, and cuddly, okay. they have really thick hard heads. Hmm. Oh. Brian Sellers? Yeah. That sounds right. I mean, he's adorable, but also he's like hard charging. Yeah. yeah.
So you did something really cool uh, at the end of the race. You get a trophy for winning, and you decided to go give it to a, a lucky young fan. Where does that come from? So that just comes from like me being that age and being at the racetrack and them wanting stuff like that. I mean, a trophy's a trophy to me, but like a trophy to a kid, that could turn a kid into a, a future racer, and you know, you don't know what it's gonna turn into. So are they gonna let you run this truck again after uh, you passed, I think, half the field in the first turn? Yeah. I got a good jump, that's yeah. for sure. Do you wanna thank your sponsor? Your, your wife. Okay. Yeah, the one that puts up with you and your ridiculous yard full of cars. We have a lot of people that come up here from all over the state. You know, I've got a drag racer who drives his race car up here every weekend from Sterling, which is three hours south. Yeah. You know, the racing is the thing that brings us together, but we're all here for each other. I mean, Alaska is so big, but yet the community is so small. Right. Whether you're in business or racing cars or when you get on an airplane in Alaska or you go to the terminal, you're bound to terminus to see someone you know. Right. Which I think is kind of cool. While the days may last longer and the season runs much shorter, when it comes to resourcefulness, community, and most importantly, passion, the Alaskan can best be described as one thing, a racer. How many Daytona 500s have you been to? I've been to four. OK, so Daytona and Alaska Raceway Park, which one's better? Daytona. Which is prettier, Palmer, Alaska, or Mansfield, Ohio? Palmer. Would you rather race here or Sebring, Florida? If I had the chance, I would definitely go to Florida. But he, this will always be my number one. Hey! If you could describe racing in Alaska in one word, what would it be now? Amazing. Awesome. Picturesque. It's extreme. Extreme. Harsh. Free. Probably crazy. Freedom. Because we get to do what we want to do, and everybody gets to do what they want to do. Midnight sun. Rubbing shoulders with friends and having fun. How is that one word? That's a one word? Fun. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I know drivers come up from the lower 48 uh, to, to race against you guys sometimes. You guys go down there sometimes. Is there anybody that you would absolutely never want to race against? Oh, man. I never want to race against Dane Cameron. So thinking about all the people you've raced against, if there was one person you would outright ban from competing against you guys, who would it be? You know, I, I don't know about ban, but if I think about being on the Iditarod Trail, like being close to somebody, having to be around them, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I would just would not want to be in that situation, Dane Cameron. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Obviously, there's any number of big name drivers I'm sure you'd love to come out here and bring some fans. Is there any driver that you wouldn't want to, to race with out here? That's a hard question, but um, even after Robbie Gordon, I would probably not ever want to race against Dane Cameron. Suck it, Cameron. Suck it, Cameron. Suck it, Cameron. Do you have any favorite race car drivers? Oh, yeah, Brittany Force. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Big fan of hers? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, yeah, John Force, too. John Force is the man, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you if you know who Graham Rahal is? Um, no, I do not. <laughs> Perfect answer. He's married to Courtney Force. But he's also a race car driver, but don't worry about it. He's old potatoes. He's old news. Okay. Get it.